Eh, es un gusto darles la bienvenida a este primer día eh, de funciones del Festival Internacional de Cine de Morelia y con la plática eh, de esta mañana iniciamos una serie eh, de pláticas, eh, mesas de discusión y, y paneles de discusión que vamos a tener durante toda la semana en este espacio y en algunos otros espacios de la ciudad, así que esperamos nos puedan acompañar y es para el, para el festival un honor darle la bienvenida a un gran amigo del festival, a un gran amigo del cine y a un gran amigo de México, al senador Chris Dodd, que es eh, eh, el presidente actualmente de la asociación de, de Motion Picture Association de Estados Unidos, es la asociación que representa los grandes eh, estudios de Hollywood, eh, fue senador por más de 25 años en, en el, por el estado de Connecticut y, y en su eh, paso por el Senado apoyó muchas iniciativas que apoyaban al comercio bilateral México-Estados Unidos y también a la integración de, de América del Norte. Así que eh, pues les pido un, un fuerte aplauso para el senador Chris Dodd. I'm also pleased to be returning to Mexico, my personal relationship and that of my families. And I know these days, given the political environment, and I'm not going to speak about that today, but we're all very conscious of it. But I want you to know there are those of us who have great affection uh, for this country and our relationship over the years. And so I thought I might just take a minute. I appreciate Alejandro's referencing my, my background and my history here, but I'm one of six children. And all of my brothers and sisters studied in Mexico at one time or another. And as I, uh, I was a given, I was a, what they call a miembro del cuerpo de paz, formado por President Kennedy hace muchos décadas. Pero yo estudiaba y vivía en la República Dominicana por algunos años. Y él me enseñó mucho en estos años. Y después de eso, como un miembro del Congreso, yo estuve en el Congreso por 36 años. You'll say, we're joven, but I couldn't be <laughs> And I was there for those many years, and I chaired the committee of the subcommittee on the Americas. And I had the great uh, deal of pleasure working on issues important to both the United States and Mexico. I was proud to support President Clinton's efforts to aid both Mexico and the U.S. economy as a strong proponent of NAFTA. And I still believe today, despite the words of others, that NAFTA was good for Mexico, good for the United States, and good for the economy of the people of this part of the world. Each year, for 26 straight years, I brought lawmakers from the United States Congress and Mexican Congress together. At times, one year here, the next year in the United States, back and forth for more than a quarter of a century. For our annual U.S.-Mexico interparliamentary meetings, we gathered annually to share our thoughts, our opinions, and our hopes and aspirations and issues of mutual concern to our two nations. Through those efforts and by working together, both in Mexico and in the United States, we helped to strengthen the special relationship of our two peoples. Though I'm no longer in public life, and many people ask me, you were in Congress for 36 years, now you're in the movie business. What's common between movie business and politics? Yo siempre digo que yo dejé los malos actores atrás, Y ahora yo tengo relaciones con más actores en este negocio, en esta industria de filmmaking. So it's kind of bad actors in both cards. I say that with some humor. So I'm proud to wear my order of the Aztec Eagle uh, when I'm in Mexico. Very proud to have been presented this by the government of Mexico many years ago to demonstrate my affection and deep appreciation for the relationship between our peoples. And I want those of you here and elsewhere, despite what you hear from some, the North of here, most Americans love this country and love the relationship. And it's important to remember that in the coming days. So my hope is, again, we'll have strong leadership in our countries that will reflect the importance of that relationship. When I was last year, I spoke about my hopes for increasing the artistic and commercial impact of Mexican cinema. Two years later, I'm standing at this very stage where I was two years ago, to tell you what many of you already know, those of you in this audience and elsewhere, Mexican cinema is taking the world by storm, and that's not an exaggeration. In this relatively brief amount of time, just over the last couple of years, Alejandro Gonzalez Inaratu won the Best Picture and Best Screenplay Oscar for Birdman, earned Best Picture Academy Award nomination for The Revenant. Emmanuel Lubezki, won his third Academy Award in a row, unheard of, unheard of, for cinematography, an outstanding achievement. 
Martin Hernandez was nominated for sound editing and Oscar for his work on The Revenant as well, and a significant accomplishment. No Paul, no small feat indeed. Nicaraguan born Gabriel Serra Arguello was nominated for Best Short Subject Documentary for his work on The Reaper, by the way, a Mexican production. Mexico's industry is more robust, more relevant, and more successful than ever, delighting audiences not just here at home, but around the world. While Mexican films continue to attract huge audiences in the United States, the cinematic offerings are also a sensation in other nations as well. Since I was last here, Mexican cinema has received 367 awards at international film festivals, including in Berlin, Cannes, San Sebastián, and Venice. Some of the most prominent Mexican films include Los Gatos, La Región Salvaje, the short film El Trompetista, and this year's Academy Award nomination for Best Foreign Film, Desierto, directed by Onas Curón. Indeed, Mexico has established itself as a leading source of films and TV shows for the worldwide Spanish-speaking market. With 42,000 people in this country who got up this morning in Mexico and went to work in the film and television industry, and another 23,000 people in this country employed in related indirect jobs. That's more than 70,000 people in this country who go to work every day in this industry and the numbers are growing. Overall, in 2015, the industry added 13.8 billion pesos to the Mexican economy. And it is no wonder this industry makes such a significant economic contribution to the economy of this nation. Between 2013 and 2015, Mexican films released abroad took in more than $100 million. And the potential for growth is virtually limitless when you consider that there are 450 million Spanish-speaking speakers, speakers in the world, and that number in the next few years will grow to more than 530 million people, a phenomenal increase in growth. Through that economic activity, Mexico now ranks as the 20th largest exporter of creative goods, not just film and television, but creative goods in the world. And that's up five notches from where it was just 24 months ago and growing. And finally, the Mexican government fosters and promotes the motion picture and television industry. And I want to thank them. As the head of the Motion Picture Association, we look for cooperative governments around the world that will support their local industries as well as foreign industries in making it possible for these dramatic stories can be seen by people all over the world. And the government of Mexico today is being of help. The Comisión Mexicana de Filmaciones has helped make this country become a growing destination for film production, now among the top 20 film producing nations uh, in, the, in the world. And so it's important that we realize how important those contributions can be. More than $50 million per year is, donated, uh, is devoted rather, to film production by the Mexican Film Institute's funding and tax incentive. Last year alone, there were 140 films produced in Mexico. Eight out of every 10 of those pictures received some form of help from the Mexican Film Institute. And one out of every three of those pictures were international co-productions. Let me just tell you a side story about this because I think it's important as an audience we understand this. For the rest of this century, film production is going to be very different than what we've been used to growing up. I often cite the example of The Life of Pi. I don't know how many of you saw The Life of Pi. It's a great film, good film. That movie is sort of instructive of what it looks like in the future. The book was a Canadian book, The Life of Pi. The movie was directed by Ang Lee from Taiwan. The crew was all from Asia. The actors were all from India. And the company in this case was 20th Century Fox. If you want to know what the film industry looks like in the future, that's what it is. If you saw the Grand Budapest Hotel, another example, of co-production, a lot of people being involved, a lot of nations being involved in putting together these stories. And that's very exciting. Exciting for Mexico, exciting for people who love film, exciting for audiences who want to see the diversity of storytelling that has made this industry so appealing 
to so many over the years. And it's not just Mexican cinema that has flourished. The overall creativity and reach of movies throughout Latin America is entirely impressive. Latin American box office increased 13% last year, the largest single increase anywhere in the world. And it is up more than 31% since the year 2011. Again, the largest increase anywhere in the world is in this part of the world, in America, Latin America. The Latin American film market is now a $3.4 billion industry. The bottom line is this. The good news is that our industry, your industry, is not just existing, it is thriving and it is growing. And that's La Buena Noticia. That's the good news that we need to remind people. And so it's a good indication of where things are headed. Now let me tell you a little bit about what I'm worried about, having told you the good news. There's some worrisome signs. This is an industry, it's a business, it's an art form, but it's also a business. And we need to understand that it costs money to produce these great stories, because it's resources that have to be allocated. And creativity, and copyright, intellectual property are essential ingredients for the livelihood and success of this industry, if we're going to go forward. So what are the stakes? What are the worries and problems that we have, and what can be done to address them? Let me explain what I mean. Copyright is what ensures that every one of the hardworking individuals involved in bringing films and television series to life in this country have jobs and are fairly compensated for the countless hours of hard work they contribute to these stirring productions. Keep in mind this, if you will. 96% of the people involved in the film business work below the line. Below the line. 96%. These are people who are driving trucks, they're carpenters, they're electricians, they're seamstresses. When you stay around at the end of a film and you wait for that long list of people, those people rarely if ever walk a red carpet. They're never on the cover of a movie magazine. Now, these are the people who make this business possible. And too often because we don't see them on the screen, we don't think about them. And other people obviously are well paid, they're well compensated. But too often we fail to recognize that that 96% number is critically important. Without them, we have no industry, we have no business. And so the issue of copyright and creative content and protecting intellectual property goes to the heart of this industry and its ability to continue to thrive and grow. Copyright ensures that independent producers, film studios, financial backers have the chance to be financially compensated and rewarded if they so desire, for the risks that they have taken in producing these products. And equally important, as an incentive to try again to create that next great film, that next great story that we are all waiting for as an audience. Without copyright protections, the Moravia Film Festival simply would not exist. Filmmakers, television producers, and all who work on their productions would have no incentive no compensation for creating their works of art and entertainment that they produce. As technology enables the dissemination of more content to more people in more places, filmmakers are faced with an escalating risk that their movies or their television programming will be stolen and distributed via DVDs, set-top boxes, online, or any other new means coming along denying these artists and hardworking people their just compensation for their work. That is why the Motion Picture Association, working with our colleagues here in Mexico and elsewhere, are trying to educate people about this, educate our audiences about it. The people who love what we do the best around the world. They're our allies in all of this. It isn't just about rewarding the people who make the film, but rewarding the audiences that love these stories and want to see more of them. You are involved in this as well, and you are at risk, in fact, if we don't work together to try and make these things work better. The Mexican government, agencies, and our own industry allies are negotiating and implementing trade agreements which are also important, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is now being considered by both the Congress in the United States, as well as here in Mexico, and 10 other nations around the Pacific Rim. And that's a very important provision, which has uh, dealing with uh, intellectual property and content creation as well. That trade agreement, or this trade agreement, is not just a one-way agreement that protects not only film and television made in the United States, but in Mexico and other nations as well. 
To the contrary, the TPP protects all film and television from theft, regardless of where it was created. But that is only half the story. We also support the Trans-Pacific Partnership because it expands the market for movies made here, the United States and elsewhere in those nations, and television programming as well, by breaking down those trade barriers, such as quotas and tariffs and discriminatory taxes and other impediments to distribution and production. Protecting intellectual property and improving market access are critically important to not only Hollywood and Mexico, but also to nations around the world who either are in this business or want to be in the business of telling their stories. And because of the growing importance of the Mexican film and television production, Mexico's economy, and because of their importance of the growing global marketplace to the continued growth of the Mexican film and television industry. Trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership allow Mexico and its producers to compete overseas, reaping significant benefits for this country and the people who work in this industry. Beyond the 12 countries involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, if the next generation of Mexican artists and filmmakers are to have an opportunity to create and market their creations more broadly than protecting long-established and internationally recognized principles of copyright is more important today in this digital age than ever, ever before. As an industry, I can tell you here this afternoon that we are working together tirelessly to create new distribution services every day in order to make more of our films and television legally available to more people everywhere at an affordable cost. The good news is that we are now have established some 400 online legal distribution services available to consumers around the world for watching film and television series. In Mexico, just in the last few years, there are at least 14 new legal digital platforms. Three of the most prominent are Claro Video, Film and Latino, and Netflix. We need to remind audiences of these destinations. We can work and must show them that honest legal content viewing is only one of two clicks away. We're working together as well, private industry and government across the globe to curb the growth of piracy, ensuring international copyright is respected and protected through meaningful enforcement. We've seen positive developments in Mexico as well, and I appreciate the efforts by the government here and law enforcement agencies to root out and deter content theft. But let me also make an appeal to you in this audience most of whom or all of you are not involved in the government, but as an audience, as an audience speaking out against piracy helps this industry to grow and thrive. You're an audience that loves this content, loves this industry, and we need other voices to be added to the debate that talk about the value of protecting intellectual property and copyright so that we can continue to see the investments made in these efforts, not just the production, not just the distribution, but also the exhibition as well. In 2015, your Attorney General created the Digital IP Crime Unit to investigate and prosecute intellectual property crimes, and we all applaud that. And this specialized unit has been working with the creative industries to crack down on the notorious illegal markets, not only located here, but elsewhere all over the world, as well as addressing online complaints. Other federal authorities, such as the federal police, particularly in the scientific police and the cyber crime prevention, department have joined efforts in combating online piracy, including the recent seizure of one site it's called Kick-Ass Torrent. Located in Poland, operated out of the Ukraine, there were 50 million illegal downloads on a monthly basis, the largest in the world. It took three years to find the operation, because today they can move anywhere in the world given what technology can provide today. But it took that long to find that operation and yet 50 million illegal downloads on a monthly basis. And those kind of activities do such great damage to the innovators and creators, the talented people who produce this content. Other federal authorities, and I mentioned them, have uh, contributed significantly to these efforts. Also, the Attorney General's Office has been working with motion picture companies and cinemas to develop a warning notice program shown in cinemas. And they're making an effort to make this appealing, particularly to younger people about why stealing content can be harmful to people. It's not easy, because obviously at home with new technologies, downloading illegal content 
can be done in privacy without anyone watching. And yet if we can educate people about why this hurts an industry that very person loves so much, maybe we can make a difference through our education efforts as well. At any rate, we look forward to continue working with our friends here and elsewhere so we can do a good job of protecting the content of our creators. And with our policymakers and the executive and legislative branches to adopt and implement on both sides of our border strong copyright protections to build important support for the Trade Pacific Partnership Agreement along the way. As we've seen at this week's festival, regardless of where movies are made, the world's greatest filmmakers recognize that the reoccurring themes and emotions expressed in the films you're seeing, courage, justice, humanity, love, conflict, and more, connect all of us, regardless of ethnicity, linguistic differences, that universal storytelling. These themes and emotions are not unique to any country or culture. They transcend national boundaries and borders. They're not Mexican or American or German or anything else. They're great stories. And a great story well told reaches each and every one of us. And there's such a great history here of that importance. I can't quantify what I'm about to tell you. I can tell you about the economics, the jobs. I can tell you about the importance of the number of theaters, the number of studios, the number of films, the number of awards. What I can't tell you is how each and every one of us have been changed by the storytelling. Not just to be entertained, but to be educated, to be motivated, to become better understanders and students of history, what happened before. The film Naruda last evening from a generation who may not have been aware of the political environment in which he was writing his poetry in Chile is an important contribution that film makes. And here in this country, you've done that over the years. So aside from all of the economic benefits, there's a benefit that goes beyond economics and a quantitative analysis that reaches us as an audience, changes our lives, makes us better as people, in my view. And the history here, beginning with Los Ovidados in 1950, more than seven decades ago, and you can probably go beyond that in films that made a difference. And that story focusing on the fate of children growing up in poverty in Mexico was a profound film that made a difference in the lives of people in this country. El Crimen del Padre Amuro in 2002, a touching and moving story about a young priest and understanding and grappling with his emotions at the time. Presunto Cuvalli, we talked about last night, Alejandro, and that film in 2011 by Roberto Hernandez and Jeffrey Smith, a documentary following a man falsely accused of, uh, of murder. And what a difference that film made in the life, not just of that individual, but also legitimately raised questions about a criminal justice system that allowed that travesty to happen. La dictadura perfecta. That's not about Hillary Clinton, I want you to know. But by Luis Estrada, I hear, and again, a moving story educating people. In the United States, in films you may be aware of, when we talk about Charlie Chaplin in the 1930s with the emperor, when he made fun of Adolf Hitler before anyone did with a comedy uh, that began to expose the extremism of, of Nazism. A gentleman's agreement with Gregory Peck in the 1940s on anti-Semitism. Philadelphia on HIV and AIDS. How many people in the world began to think differently about HIV and AIDS? Because Tom Hanks and the writers told a great story about a human being and what was going on in his life. A 12 Years a Slave. Uh, the, the, the film, guess who's coming to dinner? You get down a long list. So aside from the quantitative contribution, the jobs it creates, the money that it makes, there's another value. As I mentioned earlier, I spent 36 years in public life in my country. I gave a lot of speeches like this. I'd like to think I made a difference. But frankly, I could give a thousand speeches. You can write a thousand columns in the newspapers, and they don't come close to having the impact of an important story that changes how we think about the world, how it motivates and educates us. That's what's at stake in this industry. It's growing, it's getting better, but there are threats out there. So I'm always delighted to be asked to come here, to come back, to be a part of this conversation with you, to witness and see what people are creating and producing. But it's a job that all of us must be involved in. Obviously, the creators need to tell good stories, great stories. You can't make people go to a movie. The distribution is important, how we do that. Obviously, the exhibition is critically important. And I commend you, Alejandro, what you're doing, not only here, but what I learned yesterday, you actually opened up movie theaters in my home state of Connecticut as well. So thank you for that, by the way. 
along the way, but making that possible. Great theaters, great exhibition experiences. And obviously it's the audience. The party that goes and produces the hard-earned income down to watch the films. We're all involved in this. And so let's keep working together on this. And there is the good news. Despite the concerns we have, and legitimately so, by the way, on certain issues, there is good news to be told here. And I'm delighted once again to have been asked to come to Morelia. Muchas gracias a todos. Ahora que puede venir otra vez en el año que viene. Y otra vez, felicidades. Yes. My dad is in Canada, so I can understand. Yeah. Oh, I can speak English. <laughs> well, um, hello, thank you, before everything. And um, we are from Veracruz. Permanencia Voluntaria is the name of our medium. And um, we hear a lot of what you say relating to how the industry in Mexico has growth, how um, different, uh, many new different talents have now come over the surface and out on, into the world from, but who were originally uh, not really well known. So it's a recent thing that we've been seeing these new talents come out and like an eruption. But um, for example, in Veracruz, there is this festival that is called uh, Festival de San Sebastián de Cine Extremo. Right. And what they mean by extreme film is film that you make with your cell phone, where your crew is your family and your friends and well, it's, it's like uh, an extreme version of independent film, really. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was wondering about this. Um, well, you've raised a, a great question. And, and, um, and again, the good news here is that it, we're living in such a different era than even a few years ago. I often tell this, use this example. We all appreciate the work of Steven Spielberg. When he showed up in Hollywood, what, six decades ago, as a young kid with a dream of being in the business. You often wonder why he even went. <laughs> the likelihood five decades ago that you could show up in Mexico or show up in Hollywood or show up in Berlin or any place else and dream realistically that your work might be seen was very, very limited. In fact, it was, what, he, what was he thinking about? <laughs> that he actually thought he might actually end up being successful. Today, any one of you who show up in Morelia or show up in Hollywood or show up in someplace else with that same dream, the likelihood that you're gonna be seen and heard is so much exponentially larger than anything that existed even 10 years ago, five years ago. And there are all sorts of new platforms emerging. I often say as the head of the Motion Picture Association in the United States, I am platform agnostic. I want to be careful about saying that in front of Alejandro. Uh, but, but obviously, theatrical exhibition is an important part because the artists that I work with like to paint big pictures. They like big screens, big sound. That's their paintings. These are artists. I often want to say, can you imagine someone telling Michelangelo, Michelangelo, stop painting ceilings. People want postcards. Uh, and he said, but, but I paint ceilings. That's what I do for a living, in a sense. So theatrical exhibition is still important to us. But you and I both know, <laughs> on my iPhone in my pocket, I can watch movies and television shows with that iPad, with my computer screen that's occurring. And now with YouTube, with, with all these new independent channels that are emerging, there's so much greater likelihood. When I watched the Emmy Awards in the United States a few weeks ago, when I was growing up watching the Emmy Awards, I knew every show that was being nominated. I knew every person that was being nominated in their shows. Today, the nominations, you can't even keep up with it. There's so much out there. I was sitting by myself and saying, who are these people that are being nominated? But they're out there and they're doing great work. S short film festivals I'll tell you a great story and something maybe to consider here in Mexico and Latin America. There's a guy named, uh, I'm trying to think John's last name. Uh, remember Casey's name? 
John, the, the, the short film, John Paulson. John Paulson is from Australia. And he started 20 years ago a short film festival in Australia. And it's a great story. It's a great, it's one to remember. His first, I said, how'd you do this? What was the first festival? Oh, he said, the first festival. He said, I did it in a bar in Melbourne. And the, the name of the, the short film festival is called Tropfest, because the name of the bar was the Tropicana. And I said, well, how many entries were there? He said, there was one, mine. It was on a black and white TV, and 30 people showed up. At the 20th anniversary of the short film festival, 150,000 people showed up. It went on for a week. These are five minute films. There's no commercial value, but people are using their iPhones, they're using inexpensive production equipment to tell stories. He gives you one year, he picks a subject matter, eyeglasses. You have five minutes, not a second less, not a second more, and people compete from all over the world in producing a five minute film, and talent emerges. So today, in many ways, we're making it far more possible to do exactly what you're describing. There's a far greater opportunity and no limit to what can be done. Now John Paulson does short film festivals in Central Park in New York, in the Arab world. He had one recently and had a remarkable contribution. The winner won with an iPhone camera. That's what they use as a camera, telling a story. And that person got identified as a possibility. We're now doing internships in my studios that I represent with young people from different countries who come and work at Paramount or Universal Pictures or Disney to learn filmmaking, to be a part of it as well. More of that is happening, more co-productions. So I, I hear what you're saying, but I also think it's important to know that while that was, it's still a legitimate concern, and I understand that, everything is changing by the hour <laughs> in this world we live in. It's changing at warp speed. There are things going on today that are gonna change, that are occurring. So I can't think of a better time to be that young dreamer about wanting to be a creator and an innovator than there is today. So keep at it. And those uh, festivals that are sort of off on the side a little bit, maybe don't draw the same audiences, are very important. And don't think for a second someone isn't watching to pick up on that subject matter that no one yet has thought about. Who would have thought The Walking Dead was going to be an important television program? And today, that Walking Dead is the most popular TV program in the world, probably. More so than Game of Thrones. And again, who was thinking that that idea may actually catch on? And the town in North Carolina where they film it is now a major tourist attraction, by the way, where people flock to the all the time. So thank you for your point. Sorry about the length of the answer, too. But it's a great question. What's next? Anything else? Here, yeah. Um, you mentioned some Mexican filmmakers uh, doing work, like González Iñárritu, Guillermo del Toro. Okay. But those are actually Mexicans doing films in the United States. Yeah. I'm a little bit curious about how it's um, talking about the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Mexico is actually buying a lot of American films. Yeah. But how many Mexican, actual me Mexican films, it's the United States buying yeah, to question. make into the multiplexes out of the art house? Yeah. Or like the little independent film houses? Well, I, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I'm sorry about that. You're getting, you're getting, now you're getting a little action time here. Tell yeah. uh, I don't know the actual number, but I can tell you, I mentioned the numbers in Latin America about the viewing audience up, generally speaking, about 13% in the last year, 31% over the last four years. In the United States, I can tell you these numbers. The single largest growing audience of, of, of uh, film viewers in the United States is the Latino Hispanic community. Exactly. It's up 16%. Now, I, what are they going to see? I, I can't, I don't know. Uh, I know that the largest TV station in Los Angeles uh, is Telemundo. I mean, that's it, 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 larger than anyone else. Again, the 34, 34 million Mexican Americans living in the United States today and growing. There are four million people from Michoacan, a million from Michoacan living in Los Angeles alone. Uh, not to mention the four million across the country. There are more people living in the United States from Michoacan than live in Michoacan uh, today. And not an uncommon event, by the way. My family came from Ireland back in the 1840s. There are far more people from Ireland living in the United States than live in Ireland by far. And so it's not an uncommon occurrence. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. There may be someone who has those numbers. I just don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. See. Si. Uh, I was wondering, uh, before you mentioned uh, a little bit the topic about copyright, uh, also by, by the 
the, the answer before. I was thinking uh, there is a situation in this YouTube platform where, well, it's almost uh, universal and free, uh, a new free way for every uh, aspiring to filmmaker to, to the filmmaking. Uh, but still, uh, what, what got me wondering is today uh, a lot of movies get, well, the, the best publicity they, they can have is uh, like uh, comments and, well, people getting to talk about it, to recommend it to some other group of people. Uh, it's, uh, but the copyright right now is like uh, a shark around YouTube. You can't really make a reference about how good it's a movie, how uh, certain topics are made without getting some warnings. Uh, I mentioned this because I found it really interesting last year. Uh, I found a little bit of cases where they actually get uh, some opinions about certain movies, but I found uh, doing a little bit of research how it's used uh, the the copyrights, the one who owns the copyrights of certain material just can't be argued with, uh, as, as I read it. Uh, I found this phenomenal interesting because uh, I just saw uh, legal issues where most people just got uh, an, ama uh, an amazing amount of debt because they just can't uh, handle this omnipresent ghost of copyrights, for saying something. I just was wondering, what's your opinion about the subject? Yeah. Uh, you think it uh, will, will be necessary some sort of regulation, will be, uh, or perhaps even stop making any word about it, right? Yeah. You just don't mention any... Opinion about? No, I think you, listen, you know, like any issue, there there are balances, and I was talking about the inherent concern I have. the The average film in the United States costs a hundred million dollars to make today. Only four out of ten films make money. Two out of ten make money through the exhibition period. Two more make money if you had the post exhibition period. Uh, so, in the best of circumstances, in the United States, six out of ten films lose money. So when you're trying to get people, in most of our films, the big tentpole stuff, the Captain America stuff, the studios finance. The films that run from $500,000 to $40 million uh, are all financed privately, by and large. Under the best of circumstances, it's hard to get people to write a check, knowing that the likelihood you're going to get money back is pretty small. <laughs> And, and when you add the element, by the way, it may be a great film. Hurt Locker is a great example. Catherine Bigelow, great film, beats Avatar, and rightfully so in my view, for the best picture that year. Uh, that was a total financial disaster, that film. Uh, it was stolen so many times that, that it just was a money-losing proposition. Catherine Bigelow, great director, first woman to win the Oscar for Best Director. Uh, copyright's not an unlimited right. <laughs> Uh, and in a modern world of technology, you need to think about it in the context of how to apply it so it doesn't become so onerous that, as I think I understood your question, you deprive sort of people to have the creative abilities without worrying about all the legal implications that occur. And I don't disagree with you about that. It has to be done with some sense of balance. I've never advocated that the industry itself ought to be able to make the unilateral decision that something is a violation of copyright. There needs to be a due process you go through. If you're going to make that allegation, it shouldn't be the company that can decide whether or not that's a violation. You've got to make sure people have a right to defend themselves against those allegations. But overall, the question of whether or not there's a need for copyright. Let me tell you something I worry about. I'm not going to hide my politics from you. I was a liberal Democrat in the United States as a senator and as a congressman. I see the absence of 
destroying copyright is a form of neo-colonialism in many ways. Developing countries, put aside film and television for a minute. Just think about the idea of creativity. Someone growing up in Morelia who has a great idea, a brilliant idea, uh, the idea. To what extent does that person have the ability to be able to protect their idea, their creativity, to create the kind of economic activity that could put literally hundreds of people to work or more in a country? I worry that these big corporations that want the data, that's what they want, they want the data, because they sell you, you understand that. Uh, when you touch that computer screen and tell them something about yourself, that information just doesn't lie there. That information is taken and sold to an advertiser. And if you wonder why you get pop-up ads on your computer screen, it's not a miracle and not by accident. It happens because someone has taken your personal information, what your tastes are, what you watch, what you eat, where you go to, taken that information from you, and then sold it to someone. That's their business model. So when they tell you it's all about a free internet and a free expression, that's, that's a lot of, you know, frankly, please, I'm not stupid, you know. It's a business. And basically you're stealing from me. I'm letting you steal from me because I'm delighted to have the access to the information I seek. But I know damn well you, what you want. You want my personal information to sell to someone else and deprive that creator, maybe growing up as a kid in this town, to add to the economic value. And if we just let these large multinational corporations be the ones who eliminate copyright and have access to that and be able to steal those ideas, I get worried about that. Not just from film and television. So I don't disagree with you, we gotta be careful how we do this. That it's not so onerous that it deprives people with the creativity and imagination. But I also understand if we get rid of it all together, you know, I know who's gonna be the winners in all of that <laughs> and, and who's gonna suffer. So that's why I worry about it so much. What else? Uh, hi. Uh, I studied uh, science computer, and uh, you said that uh, the film industry is a business, and I agree with that. But uh, sometimes, uh, if a movie is not a blockbuster, it's hard to get like an official uh, channel, an official platform, to get access to that movie. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's uh, really, really easy to get from uh, an illegal platform. And the technology is right there to anybody to take it. Uh, so some people say that uh, the industry is, uh, is doesn't want to change their their business models or their distribution mm -hmm. channels. I, I don't know their distribution model. Uh, but is there a way to get like a main legal platform to to access, especially like small films? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, the, the, do you think that the industry is working on that? Yeah, there are. And, and, and first of all, understand that the companies I represent, they'd like everybody to have access uh, to their product. <laughs> They're not opposed to people buying their product, whether it's a subscription on television or whether it's going to a movie theater and actually watching a film. Uh, and so there, there, there's a sense of rights. You have a right to be able to see something we produce, but as a producer and a creator, I have a right to determine, in a sense, how I'd like my creation to become available. I, I know today there's, everyone's talking about who can pass a law or regulation. Something I've been advocating, not with great success yet, but hopefully we can get there. There is the ecosystem that you and I are living in today, in this industry. It involves the producers and the creators. It involves the internet service providers. It involves the advertisers. It involves the credit card companies, and it involves the search engines. <clears throat> Each one of us in this ecosystem have responsibilities. Put the laws aside. If we all act responsibly in that ecosystem, I need to make sure I'm producing enough content and making it available through legal means at an affordable price for you, okay? Where my investors and people who make these products can be rewarded and compensated for what they do. That's my job. I mentioned the 400 legal distribution services, the 14 now in Mexico, and every day we try to create more of them so that I can't have someone as they have over the years say, you know, Senator, I'd love to watch your movies legally, but you know, they're not available. And so you leave me no other alternative but to steal. That was a better case five years ago than it is today. There's a lot more legal services out there. And so I'm not entirely convinced. Now, you may want to see it exactly when you want to see it. But as a creator, I have a right to determine to some degree how and when I want to release my, my, my production here. It's not just your right as an audience to demand it that as soon as it's done, I have a right to see it, in a sense. 
So we need to understand each other as both a creator and as an audience about that. Now that's getting closer. When I was growing up, and I have a lot of white hair in there, but when I was growing up, things like, films like, I'm trying to think of some uh, Chariots of Fire uh, or uh, Lawrence of Arabia, they would stay in a movie theater for a year, a whole year, <laughs> be there. Today, a film stays in a theater, Miguel, how long, what, uh, uh, two weeks? Three weeks of mess, yeah, on this. I mean, the window is closing every day to some degree. Uh, see, there are many more opportunities people have to see things and the likelihood, and because you had no other alternative to see it, but in that movie theater, the year-long exhibition made sense years ago. And today, obviously, it's come back down. And the industry is working at that. But there's a lot at stake by that, all of a sudden. You know, all of a sudden, day and date, as they call it, release, where it becomes available on your computer screen the same day it's available in Sinopolis Movie Theater in Morelia. You know, that's a dicey call. What happens now? What's, what's, first of all, I'm producing a product for a big screen. You're going to watch it on your iPhone or your television. So we need to strike that balance. Now, let me tell you this. In that ecosystem I talked to you about, everybody is trying to help, except one. I'll be very blunt with you. Search. If I could just get Google to take illegal sites off page one and move it to page three, I'd say it's a victory. It's over with. Why do you have to put illegal content on the first page? You're not making enough money out there? You know, do you have to put really the illegal stuff that's most available? In Europe, 40% of audiences, when they go to watch a legal movie, are taken to the illegal sites automatically. Not because they asked for it. They take them there automatically. And this is not changing that algorithm. Don't tell me you can't change the algorithm. You do it with child pornography every day. Because uh, you know you'd be in deep trouble politically if you made too much of that available to people. The Congress in Mexico and the United States and elsewhere would shut you down. So you can do it. Don't tell me you can't do it. But if you really want to help out the creators and the innovators making great stories, just move the eagle legal stuff to page three or four on the thing. I'll call it a victory. It's the one piece of that equation that is not really working yet. But I need voices out there that will talk about this. And, and people like yourself are critical in this discussion. You're the consumer. <laughs> and and, and if, if people are saying, look, uh, you know, I, I, I want it when I want it, how I want it, where I want it immediately, and, and basically I'm going to steal it, and that's okay. Uh, We've we got big problems emerging. I don't know how I'm going to finance this stuff. Uh, I don't know how you're going to compensate people in these jobs. And it's a labor-intensive business, by the way. You know. So it's a great question, and I'm glad you raised it. Because everyone, frankly, I hear it all the time, everywhere I go, all over the world. I'm leaving tomorrow for Paris, London, Brussels, and Warsaw in similar conversations. So it's now you know, a global business here we're talking about. And candidly, I could have this audience in Warsaw, Paris, Brussels, a lot of the same questions, same issues being raised. Uh, but but it's, we're working at it. And we just need to be better at it. And every day we try to get better at it. Produce great stories, make them available to people when and how and where people want to see them. But make audiences understand it's not a miracle these things occur. Uh, it's expensive, there's a long lead time. And a lot of people's jobs are at stake, and not just the big movie stars. You know, it's those people you and I—they won't be here tonight. The red carpet out here, with all due respect to the movies that 140 films made in Mexico, there may be some, but the people who are going to walk the red carpet and have their pictures taken are not going to be the carpenter and the truck driver and the plumber and the electrician and the woman making the costumes and the makeup. <laughs> but theirs, whose livelihoods. And don't tell me their lives aren't important to you. You may not care, and I may not care about Brad Pitt and how much he makes. But I know you care and I care about that woman in this town or that man who raises a family, pays his mortgage on his home, feeds his kids and educates them because he has a good job in film and television. And they deserve your respect and my respect and all of that. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Usted ha dicho que finalmente el TLC nos ha beneficiado y que el Acuerdo Transatlántico también nos va a beneficiar. No voy a entrar en, no voy a entrar en detalles sobre los acuerdos del TLC ni del, ni del Acuerdo Transatlántico. Pues es muy complicado. En el fondo, finalmente esos acuerdos lo que permiten, y usted me, me corrige si me estoy equivocando, es eh, quitar o eliminar o disminuir protecciones presupuestales o legales a las cinematografías nacionales, abrir el mercado, eso sí, sí para que pueda eh, 
eh, se pueda negociar en otros, en otros eh, fuera de las fronteras. Eh, finalmente, el cine mexicano sigue, de, como usted bien lo dijo, sigue dependiendo de los recursos públicos, sigue dependiendo del apoyo, si, si no, no fuera posible. ¿sí? Eh, en el caso, por ejemplo, del Acuerdo Transatlántico, me gustaría que usted nos aclarara. Aquí hay un debate sobre la disminución de presencia del cine nacional en las pantallas. Algunos lo consideran que es una medida que no existe en el Acuerdo Transatlántico. Otros que sí, que no se maneja de esa manera, pero sí se, se, se sugiere una poca presencia, menos presencia de cinematografías nacionales en las pantallas. Mi pregunta... En concreto es, usted como representante de la Motion Picture, ¿está de acuerdo en que se quite cualquier protección o cualquier, cualquier protección hacia las cinematografías nacionales, que se disminuyan los, 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 los recursos públicos? Bueno, es una buena pregunta, gracias por esa pregunta. Para entrar en los detalles de mi propia visión es... You know, audiences have the right to vote with their feet <laughs> and not to be told what they can and cannot see, <laughs> in a sense. I get nervous about it with artistic creations. I think it's dangerous territory to get involved. I understand the idea of at least being able to guarantee a certain amount of production and audience, but it doesn't guarantee the audience is going to show up. And, and so I, I worry about the limitations that those kind of protections provide. Now, the transit, the, the, the transatlantic agreement is way off. I don't know when that will happen. After Brexit and various other matters, uh, that may take some time. And as you know, in the United States, both of our major presidential candidates have taken the position of being absolutely opposed to TPP as well. So I'm not terribly optimistic TPP is going to be ratified. Uh, we'll see what happens in the post-election period. And I know in the past there have been desires, and certainly there's a lot of political appeal at a certain level uh, for limitations and quotas and so forth. But there's a part of me here that, that wonders, and the ultimate value in all of that, uh, lacking enough of confidence that uh, their creations that are going to have an audience, regardless beyond uh, our own immediate audience. Imagine of the 140 films that were made, a third of them last year in Mexico were co-productions. The days when you're going to have, and by the way, I, I didn't mention, 100,000 hours of Mexican television is exported to 100 nations in 30 different languages today. No other nation comes close to what Mexico is providing on a global marketplace And this. And I wonder, you've got to be careful, but you know, people, we say we want to protect ourselves, all of a sudden you have someone else responding to that. And they decide, well, you know what, I'll tell you what. You know, maybe we ought to have less Mexican TV production we're taking here to protect our own TV production, our own country. These things can take you to places we don't anticipate. TPP, and the reason I feel strongly about it, I voted for and against various trading agreements over 36 years. Put aside the economics for a minute, and I'm not disagreeing that these are legitimate issues that you're raising. For those of us who care about the environment and climate change, for those of us who care about trafficking in women, For those of us who care about child labor, in addition to the other items, are part of this agreement. If this goes down, all of those issues won't be brought up again for decades, in my view. And they're not insignificant. This trading agreement covers a lot more than just economics, in a way. It eliminates 18,000 tariffs. 18,000 tariffs go under this agreement. How many Mexican goods and services? I mentioned how Mexico is one of the leaders in the world in exporting creative goods and services. One of the leaders in the world, music. And today, you pay a price to export some of that because of tariffs. Eliminate those tariffs, you increase dramatically the opportunity for Mexican artists and industries to be able to market in those marketplaces that today are denied in some ways. So I, I hear you. I think it's not an illegitimate issue. But I'm worried that if we get so involved in that and set those floors or even ceilings, that in some ways we may do greater damage because we don't do it without reciprocity. We do it, someone else does it. You know, in Europe, it's a long-standing problem with them, what they call the, in French, l'exception culturelle, the cultural exception. And the French particularly uh, have been hard over on this uh, for years. And I understand that to some degree and, and understand that it's invaluable to encourage domestic industry. 
So I'm somewhat sympathetic to the point, but I, I can't leave this podium without telling you that I also think there's some real dangers in going down that road. But I appreciate your question. Anything else? Nada más. Okay. <laughs>